Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alex McCallion. I'm the Director of Works and Precinct in your Minster. And um, as uh, Delma said, I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Laura Cotter, um, who um, works for your Minster Fund. So I'm going to be setting the scene um, and talking about the neighbourhood plan that we've been developing over the past uh, five years which sets out a sustainable future for York Minster. And then Laura's going to talk specifically about our new centre of excellence, which is one of the key projects of our neighbourhood plan. So the Minster itself needs no introduction, but you might not be aware that um, the chapter of York, the governing body of York Minster, are actually responsible for just under seven hectares of York City Centre. And it's an incredibly complex estate. Um, we have 53 properties. 52 um, are listed, most are Grade 2 star listed, three are Grade 1 listed. The Minster itself is a scheduled monument. Most of the estate, 80%, is scheduled in its own right, so we can't put a spade in the ground any deeper than nine inches. Um, it's under close scrutiny. The Minster means a great deal to many people in this city, and indeed globally. This is an iconic building of international reputation and yet it is uh, not fit for purpose for the chapter of York. Um, we welcome over 750,000 people a year, we haven't got our own tickets office, we're the only cathedral in England without a dedicated cafe, uh, very basic estate management issues we have, very little storage space, the uh, facilities in the stone yard are um, well beyond their sell-by date, and um, we have major changes to, to take place in the cathedral. So, how on earth do you navigate all of that? Um, when I started this process, I was starting from a position that the answer is no, what's the question? So when I talk about a sustainable future, I'm talking about financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, and heritage craft skills, so that we've always got the heritage craft skills that are needed to care for a complex estate like this. Financially, it costs over £30,000 a day to operate the Minster, and that's going to continue to rise as our energy prices uh, rocket. We get no central government funding, unlike our friends in Europe, and uh, in 2019, we welcomed just under three quarters of a million visitors. Um, we rely heavily on our paying visitors. 50% of our income comes through ticket sales. And of course, COVID struck in 2020 and that income just dropped off a cliff. So we need to make sure we have a more sustainable income flow moving forwards. Um, and you can see up here, our fabric costs for the next five years are set to be 11 million pounds. This is rising on a monthly basis with costs continuing to rise. And our capital projects are forecast at the moment at 14 and a half million pounds. In terms of environmental, uh, climate change is the biggest threat to the Minster at the moment. So in the past it has been uh, through um, air and the uh, coal fire plants just downstream from the Minster. Now it's extreme weather events. We cannot get the water off the building quickly enough. It's causing rapid cavernous decay of our stone, which leads to uh, saltation um, and, uh, and, and failing structures. And, and I mean, the state of the stonework on the Minster, it looks this mighty, mighty building on the skyline. It's actually incredibly fragile. And heritage craft skills, of the 42 Anglican cathedrals in this uh, country, only 10 still have functioning works departments. We're incredibly fortunate in, in York that we are the largest in the country, um, but there's a national shortage of skilled craftspeople, um, and we need to be transferring knowledge, um, which Laura's going to talk about uh, in, a, in a minute through all of the international partners uh, that we've made. Our, our facilities, as I've said, are less uh, than perfect, and we're working very closely with your Glazier's Trust at the moment to put uh, protection into our uh, medieval stained glass windows. We have this internationally uh, famous uh, um, collection of in situ medieval stained glass at your Minster. But uh, we have 68 unprotected windows at the moment. And the issue is this, um, whilst we can progress this um, to, to put the uh, protective glazing in, the issue is the stone. The stone, um, the state of the stone is much, much worse than we originally thought. So at the current programme, the stone renewal is going to take 30 years. So that's not sustainable. We need to speed up this restoration process. So there were three options, uh, or four options available through um, the English planning system. 
The first was to create a master plan that had no uh, basis um, in uh, planning law, which would have been a complete waste of time. The second uh, was to have our master plan ratified by the City Council, but for such a complex estate, this wouldn't have been useful for chapter, it wouldn't have carried enough weight. We could have gone down the supplementary planning document route, but we can't do that in York because York hasn't had an adopted local plan since 1956. So that route wasn't available to us. Um, so the only route available was to create our own set of dedicated planning policy by taking advantage of the neighbourhood plan regulations. Those were brought about in 2010 by the coalition government at the time and through the Localism Act to give power to local people to set development within their area. So normally through a parish council they'd set their housing numbers and employment land allocations. What we did was establish the precinct as a neighbourhood forum, so carving out a little bit of the guild ward as our, as our effectively our parish. So um, in 2019 we established the neighbourhood forum, so it became a legal entity. Um, that was made up by residents and businesses within the neighbourhood plan area, and we had four major public consultation events. So there's a bit of consultation fatigue in York at the moment, so there's a lot of consultation, but we received 683 comments um, over the four years, which doesn't sound a lot, but for planning consultations it, it was a lot, and some of them were incredibly detailed given the status of York Minster. So we, we generally listened each time we consulted, we, we made major changes to the plan. On the first day when we started with the issues and options consultation, we put a marquee up in Dean's Park, and the night before, your press ran an article saying your minister to develop Dean's Gardens. So we spent the first Saturday calming everybody down. We had all these array members of the public coming in, quite rightly. Um, and then I think slowly the city began to understand that we were doing our best to care for the future of the minister and doing the best that we could to, to navigate and, and, and deliver changes. And people, um, when we went to referendum, ultimately um, were supportive. So Historic England have been super throughout this process. We've worked very closely in partnership with Historic England and the City Council to do this. Um, and um, they're hoping to use this as a case of national best practice. It's the first neighbourhood plan of its kind. So um, I won't go into detail on this, but we went through various iterations of the plan um, over many years. Um, and then last year, um, the plan went to referen referendum, so it had to go through down to central government um, to be audited, and then it went to referendum. Now this was a major risk. As we got closer and closer to referendum, I started to think, crikey, the power of the adoption of this is in, in the local community. Um, but 83% voted in favour to adopt the plan, and then the plan went to the council's executive last June and was formally ratified. So that gives the chapter of York adopted planning policies against which to deliver their planning applications. And we have a series of allocated sites within the development plan for the city. So the only allocations in the city centre at the moment. And effectively, we've created a zonal master plan. So four areas of change. Area one is where we're focusing the busy visitor experience. So this is where our visitors will come in, buy their ticket, um, go to our new refectory, which is under development and opening this spring, a brand new park, um, College Green, um, which has been refurbished at the moment. Area 2 is a major um, public realm initiative to create a new square at the west front of the cathedral, the first square in the city for over 200 years which will be named in honour of the late Queen. The first piece of that jigsaw puzzle was to erect a statue in one of the empty niches of the West Front, and you'll all have known a scene that that actually became the first uh, memorial statue. But the neighbourhood plan was very clear from the start that this must be created in-house by one of our very skilled masons to showcase the skills that we have here in York. And area three, this is where we will be developing a new museum. The uh, chapter of York um, are custodians of a collection of over 300,000 artefacts. We don't have anywhere to display these. So the vision is to create a new museum here, just behind um, the old palace. And then area four is our back of house, including an allocation to develop uh, new facilities for the stone yard. So the plan now carries significant weight. As we went through all of the consultation exercises, the weight uh, increased. 
and we've gone straight in to secure various consent. So you can see there is an awful lot taking place at the, at the moment at the Minster. We've got uh, six consented schemes, many of those are on site or about to go on site. We have, I'm just counting these up, a number in uh, live applications at the moment uh, or at pre-app and uh, this year we'll be starting to work on the development brief for the museum. The first uh, scheme on site uh, is our new refectory. This was a major uh, consent because it secured our first solar tiles in the precinct. So the roof, not that you can tell if you're standing in front of it, is actually uh, a solar tile creating 11,000 kilowatts of power a year. It's not a huge amount of energy, it's enough to run the lights, but what it's done is set the bar high enough and set the precedent for other consents to follow. Um, we have a live application at the moment for solar on the roof of the building. Yes, you are going to have glimpse views of um, the solar panels from, from the, um, the square at the front, but only glimpse views. It's 199 solar panels which will produce a third of the energy requirements for the Minster. Um, and that's without changing any habits, so if we switch off more lights, that percentage will increase. I'm delighted to report that the Cathedral's Fabric Commission for England approved that application last week and we're waiting for the City Council to give us planning permission and then we can look at the delivery of that. So that's a major, major um, um, move in the right direction. If you look at COP27 and the message that's coming out of that, we're doing too little too late as it is and hopefully this will inspire others um, to start looking at decarbonisation um, as, a, as a, a top of the agenda as we move to net zero. This is another live application. This will be our first retrofit building. Again, solar roof, um, in, in, massive insulation within the building, air source heat pump. So we're really moving off gas as we drive towards decarbonisation. So by 2025, when all of this is in place, 50% of our energy will be from renewables. Um, College Green will open in April, St William's College will become Chapter's main offices, that, we hope to get consent for that in the next two weeks. Um, Queen Elizabeth Square, the statue um, is overlooking what will become the square and we're working with the City Council over the course of the next 12 months to work up the development brief before we go to international design competition. This needs to be world class public realm. Um, the area around the Minster at the moment is not great for a, a, a building of this status. And then the centre of excellence. So this is a campus vision, um, utilising the whole of the precinct, um, looking at all of the craft skills that are required to care for a heritage estate such as this. And we have created two new buildings. So the first is the um, heritage quad. This is repurposing existing buildings behind the deanery. So we're keeping the carbon footprint as low as possible by recycling the existing garages and reordering those as offices and uh, changing facilities. This is the new workshop. We appointed Tonkin Lu last May uh, as architect who responded to the brief absolutely beautifully that this building should sit quietly within its landscape, respect the setting of the listed buildings around it, but most importantly that visitors to the city wall would be able to engage in the process of heritage craft going on below. So they'll be able to look down off the city wall into the new workshop. And what was so important to me and Laura and others is that we wanted to keep our um, the, the skilled workforce on site. We could have rented a shed upon Clifton Moor, but if you did that, you lose the affinity between heritage craft person and the building, and it wouldn't be a centre of excellence, it would be an industrial unit. So this is why it's so important to keep them on site, and this was a key part of our planning argument. All the roof structure uh, is sustainable, so solar on the roof creating the power, all the rainwater will be collected off the main roof to flush the news and water the gardens, and then the breakout welfare space is a living roof. This will be the first gargoyle created in the precinct and taking water off the roof uh, since the 13th century. Uh, this is the tech hub um, which will store our new state-of-the-art saws and the brain of the whole facility will be in a new reordered drawing office upstairs looking down onto this facility and all of the roof will be solar so 60% of the power will come from renewables as the sun passes around. So, that's the background um, that gives you a little taste of what's going on at the Minster and all the changes you're going to see 
over the next three years, actually. It's a 15-year plan, but we'll probably have built most of it in five. So, um, Laura. Richard was going to come up here and speak for a few minutes, but uh, we're just very conscious of your networking time. We didn't want to eat into it too much. So my name is Laura Cotter, I'm Research and Partnerships Manager for York Minster Fund, appointed by Richard Shaw, and I started a project looking at research and development at York Minster, focused on stone and glass, back in May 2018, so coming to nearly five years. It was a two-year project, uh, it's now nearly five years. So when we set about, our main objectives were as listed there, was to establish best practice across the world. What was everybody else doing? What was available in terms of techniques and technologies? What was happening in engineering? What was happening in construction? Where could we take inspiration from either heritage or other sectors? How could we enhance the historic skill base with new skills? What could we bring into how the glazes and the stonemasons worked? And I spent quite a lot of time with the Masons and Glazers initially, gaining their trust, understanding their perspectives, and getting their ideas. And we narrowed down onto four main projects, which are listed project management, handling, measurement, documentation, and cutting. And then the research took place from that point. So we've done a lot of knowledge sharing, we've formed some really strong relationships with some cathedrals across the world. So Washington in America, um, Milan, Italy, the um, Kolner Dom, which is Cologne, and Nidros in Norway are our main sources of knowledge sharing that we're building relationships with. And like I mentioned, a lot of cross-sector research, so advanced engineering, looking at UK construction, what's happening in heritage, specific stone. I even went to Shanghai and presented about York Minster in this project, a heritage pres uh, pre preservation um, that's easy to say. So, some of the things that we've implemented. One of the first things we found was a pro liner. This was at a stone um, show in Italy, and this was used mainly to measure kitchens for worktops. Uh, the picture to the bottom right is one of the glazes working, actually taking measurements of the tracery windows. Uh, and this tool we've implemented in both stone and glass purchased, and it's been really interesting to see how that's developed, especially with the glazes being able to create their templates using it and move into a digital process. We've introduced photogrammetry. This is something that we learned from Nidaros a Cathedral in Norway in Trondheim. And this can be used very simply to record 3D images. So it's taking multiple photographs, running them through some software and being able to capture something like this here, which sits down in the undercroft and as you can see the salts are all coming out of it and it's degrading but we've, we're able to capture it and then in six months time capture it again and compare we've looked at 3d scanning we've done multiple trials on stone and glass and we actually purchased a scanner in april last year which we've implemented an example of things that we're able to now capture at one of the grotesques in great detail I love, uh, looks like a little face here with its mouth open. I, I just don't think you can see these features when you, even when you're up close on the scaffold, you can't see this level of detail. And then we've also looked at cutting. That was one of the projects. So back in 2019, we started doing cutting trials with a, a machinery manufacturer in Italy. We did two trials, a voussoir and a finial, and we took different approaches. So with the voussoir, we used CAD data, computer-aided design, and we ran that into the, the machine. It was programmed in, and on the finial, we, uh, one was created by a mason, which was 3D scanned, and that was programmed into the machine. And when we looked at how it compared doing it by hand, compared to using technology, so you can see there the voussoir, four days by hand, with technology, it took two hours to program the machine, but once you've done it, it's it's one it's a one-off. It took four hours to machine. We machined it to two millimeters, and it took two days to hand finish. So on one voussoir, that was a 30% saving, but over a set of 52, because we've already done the programming, that worked out as 75-day saving. 
On a finial, these are much more intricate, 29 days by hand. It took two days to program. It took two days to machine and 16 days to hand finish. Overall, 31% saving. But these come in sets of three. So for a set of three, that would be 20 days saving. And with both, we aren't losing the skill, the craft. On the finials, they always come in sets of three. So the first one will always be completed by a mason, so it then can be replicated by a machine. And there's that balance between craft skills and technology. And nobody wants to lose the craft skills. It's really important at the Minster and to continue taking on new apprentices. So from these trials and lots of work that's happened, we've got to the point last year where we've actually invested £650,000 worth in cutting technology. And Alex gave you a glimpse of that earlier. So we're purchasing three new machines, two coming from a company called Breton in Italy, who are um, a very well-known stone manufacturer. When I've travelled to different stone yards across the world, I've seen Breton coming up over and over again. So this one is a milling machine, and the second one is has a blade, it's more like a bridge saw. And then we're also investing in a small hand-articulated wire saw. And it's very much about engaging with new technology, but also I like the hand operated one because it's still a manual tool. So we've got this move from using hand tools to using a machine that's hand operated to then the large Breton machine. So we've got a nice range across the board. Another project we've looked at is how we could replace the casting process. So a traditional casting process, roughly about seven days, where moulds are taken from a weathered grotesque, as in this example, but it's very invasive, so there's the danger of damaging the surface of the piece as you're capturing it. And it used quite a lot of materials that ultimately, unless they're held for interest, they would go in the skip. So we looked at how we could do this using technology and we, if you see these two pictures, this piece was actually, the head had been knocked off it. It's two separate pieces, the little dots on it are for 3D scanning and the scanning technology intelligent enough to then, um, it can join the two together using the dots. So the middle image is uh, the 3D representation and then I found some polyurethane modelling block that's used in car manufacturing predominantly to model out new designs. We trialled a piece of that on similar cutting technology to we're investing in and overall it was around about 40% saving in the process. That was the first time we did it so we'll probably get better with that. When you compare them side by side you can really see the level of detail that's achievable and then this polyurethane model was actually used as the base for a new design by one of our um, masons who'd just come out of his apprenticeship, it was his first ever grotesque. So rather than starting from scratch, he was able to use the form of this polyurethane to build on top of because it could hold the clay. And this is the design he came up with. And if you go down to outside the Minster where the masons are working now, you can actually see this in stone. It's, it's waiting to be put upon the Minster. So all this different research we've done has actually come together for what Alex touched on earlier, which is the creation of the Statue of the Queen. We've used um, a real mix of craft and heritage skills and modern technology, and it is on display in the Minster. If you, if you go and you can see the model and read a bit more about this, so I'm just going to touch on it. But initially, Richard Bossons created a small clay model. You can see the size of it there. We had a company come in before we purchased our scanner, we had a company come in and 3D scan it, and this is the actual scanner that we've also purchased since. Using that 3D scanner, we were able to scale it up to full size, which was roughly about seven meters, and that was cut in polyurethane block. Roughly, not to a final finish, but rough enough to get the shape. And because it's light, we were also able to lift it up into the niche and test it out for sizing and, and how it sat within the framing of it. The image on the left that's rotating is photogrammetry, capturing the clay head that Richard created and using the polyurethane urethane block exactly as the other mason did, he was able to build on top of it with clay and then wash it with plaster and spend the time creating his final design because he didn't have to start from base again. He already had the form and function there, so the embellishments, he had much more time to do that. You can see again it's covered with dots and there's Richard 3D scanning his own uh, model. 
That was then sent to a stoneyard down in South Wales who were working really closely with the owner, trained with our master masons. There's a real trust and confidence there. And it was machined on a piece of technology very similar to the one that we're purchasing. It's actually slightly smaller than the one we're purchasing and took three weeks to machine. Now, initially we went with the purpose of doing it to two mil, as we'd done with the trials. And I encouraged Richard to be part of this process and he went down um, as it was his model. And when we did a trial of a hand and a face to two millimeters, what, what actually was quite amorphous, all the features had been lost into the excess material left on it. So he asked, could we try it at one and a half mil? still not enough definition, could we try it at one? And he eventually chose to have his whole uh, piece cut to half a mil, that was his decision. And that's what you can see in this video here that's happening in time lapse. It probably could have been done in less than two weeks, but the owner of the company was so nervous about the large piece of lapine that had come from France that he chose not to run the machine overnight. He wanted to be on site the whole time it was running but just gives you an idea of what's achievable with these machines. And when it arrived back, the, the um, statue on the right is the polyurethane, which is now on display in the Minster, and on the left is the actual statue that's up on the west front, but left to half a mil of material, which Richard then spent quite a few months afterwards finishing. We've also been looking at 3D printing, and when uh, King Charles came to unveil, there's Richard and I presenting a 3D printed model of the Queen statue to King Charles. So what's next? We're opening a centre of excellence, but to be a centre of excellence, we must keep pushing boundaries and looking at new technology. So we're looking now at digital sculpting. This is kind of technology used in computer game design, predominantly, but it's becoming more and more prevalent in manufacturing um, and other sectors. And here you can see this is actually a monastery in um, America who are using it to design their stonework, uh, where they're able to use a stock item like a leaf and manipulate it and change it so every leaf actually looks individual, even though uh, the, the base design is there. Whereas usually you would have to create every single one out of clay. Now we don't want to lose the process of clay, but we're looking at what else could be used. Where's the balance? How could we save some time but keep also the traditional approaches going? And here is one of our masons actually having a go with this technology. Since returning from this visit, we've actually purchased the kit and the software, and this mason is now spending he spent quite a lot of his Christmas playing with this. I kept getting messages telling me how much he loved it. Um, and he's creating what looked like quite a demonic, grotesque, I think, here. And uh, the people who were showing us it said, you can't underestimate the power of an undo button. <laughs> As I mentioned, we've been looking at 3D printing. Um, people think 3D printing, think about plastic. We've actually identified two machines that can print using stone powder mixed with a resin. So we're looking at whether we could take our own limes, magnesium limestone, grind it up, mix it with a resin, and print repairs that could then go directly onto the minster. And this is it's quite early days for this, but it's quite an interesting project that we're looking at. And then the, uh, the final thing that we're looking at, we recognise that with all the new technology we're investing in, we're going to probably produce stone faster than we have been. And as Alex touched on from a financial and, and environmental point of view, that is required. But the next problem, the next bottleneck that's going to occur is how do we fix it back onto the minster quicker? So my next project now is to start looking at alternative scaffoldings, options for working on site, that anything, handling solutions that could help us to fix faster. And this again was from a, a visit to a monastery in America where they really engaged in some really interesting scaffolding. Now they were building it from scratch, so it's not necessarily we can go down this route, but I like this because you can still see through and see the building, whereas when the scaffolding's on the minster, a lot of it's blocked off potentially for up to 10 years. So. Very early days again this project, but it's the next thing that we're looking at and, and continuing to go to exhibitions and push boundaries and see what else is coming out that's new. 
So as Richard tells me, to, we need to be world class. So to be world class, we must talk to the world. And this is just a, a range of some of the people that we're talking to um, across the world in different institutions. So thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions, I think we might. I don't know if I've gone over. <laughs> I can talk.